Welcome to the closing main stage of the day. I'm Cora Iverclyde, developer advocate at VMware. I hope you've been enjoying this breakout sessions and that you're having fun on the social track too. That's definitely my favorite. And I think the chatter on Slack backs me up. If you haven't been yet, be sure to join us on Slack to engage with the community. We've got a great lineup for you for the next hour. You'll be hearing directly from some of our customers on what drives innovation for them and from some of our engineers and product managers who'll be sharing insights into exciting technology that we've been working on at, VM at VMware. And remember, for all of these main stage talks, you can turn on closed captioning if you wanna read as you listen along. You can toggle it on and off from the settings in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. To kick us off, Hyundai Auto Ever is part of the Hyundai Motor Group family. They provide IT services and innovate in mobility software for the global Hyundai Motor Group. I'm pleased to present the CEO of, of Hyundai Auto Ever, Mr. Jun Sik Su. Under his leadership, the company is pursuing some really exciting ideas for the future of connected vehicles. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Su to the stage. Would you be willing to switch car brand to access innovative connected car feature and services? If you answer yes, then you are not alone. More people, particularly younger generation, are no longer as influenced by engine power or gas consumption. They want to be well connected. We think about this a lot at Hyundai. Hyundai Motor Group encompasses more than 30 leading companies, including Hyundai Kia Motor, which is the fifth largest car manufacturer in the world. I am CEO of Hyundai Auto Ever, which is also a part of Hyundai Motor Group. And my team plays a key role in supporting Hyundai Motor Group's IT initiatives. In particular, we work closely with Hyundai Kia Motor to help accelerate the pace of innovation and enable Hyundai to become a worldwide leading mobility company. That's right. The right of the connected car requires automotive companies to strengthen the expertise in embedded automotive software to bridge the gap between the car and mobility ecosystems. Over 4 million Hyundai vehicles are already connected with the cloud, and it is expected to increase to 10 million next year. We work to provide a high quality, personalized digital experience for drivers by enhancing the software continuously. We would see this come to life in apps like our Blue Link mobile app or the connected service in our Genesis luxury car brand. We did not become a software-driven car manufacturer by overnight though. We recognized that we had to develop the right software engineering capabilities as well as adopt modern pattern and technology that would enable this transformation. To this end, Hyundai Auto Ever has been focused on application modernization with VMware Tenzu and heavily invested in internalized capabilities like DevSecOps and microservices. We standardized on cloud projects and ecosystem for the tech stack for our microservice applications. We then established our own best practices in microservice design using domain-driven design. This enabled us to create a common model within each domain for communicating about requirement, data, and process, which simplify development for the team. We adopted a pairing program methodology by matching our engineer with the Tenju Labs engineer. It helped us learn quickly about cloud native technology in a short time. We used test-driven development practice to deliver high quality code to the market without sacrificing any lead time. What's more, we focused on enhancing the developer's experience by building a cloud native platform. Our application team can easily deploy containerized apps, scaled apps, and monitor them all by self-service. This platform team 
also provide CI/CD as well as upgrading and patching so that developers can focus on application and getting new feature into the hand of our customer. Throughout this process, we have released new apps gradually to the market and now they coexist with the legacy apps. Yes, it is a strangler pattern. We are seeing tremendous results from our using the new platform and application architecture. We reduced the future delivery time, which previously take more than 14 days to less than just three days by building up the automated process that enabled to low risk deployment. Before, we had to schedule the maintenance window during the night for application deployment. Now, we deploy new feature anytime during the day with zero downtime by updating individual microservices independently. Overall, we have achieved eight times faster time to market. Hyundai is now able to accelerate our journey to become the software-driven car manufacturer that provides the best digital experience on our customers. For example, we have secured the scalability to handle requests from more than 10 million cars to make sure all of our customers can interact seamlessly on their mobile devices, including the biggest mobile device, their car. On this journey, we will continue to build together for Hyundai in becoming a global number one smart mobility company. Thank you. You heard it, folks. Your car is your biggest mobile device. It's really interesting to think about your car as a very thick client or as an edge node, and it starts to blur the line between car and computer. Mr. Su mentioned so many key points of a mature development process. He mentioned domain-driven design, paired programming, test-driven development, microservices, containerization, CI-CD, DevSecOps, cloud, and cloud-native platforms. Did I catch them all? Good. Hyundai Auto Ever seems to have a really good handle on all aspects of software ideation, development, and delivery. So definitely keep an eye on the innovation they bring to the mobility ecosystem. Next, I want to welcome two very talented members of VMware Tanzu and Spring Engineering teams. Ole Dokuka is the lead for our socket, a key contributor to Project Reactor, and co-author of the book, hands-on reactive programming in Spring 5. He truly has a passion for all things reactive. Rosin Stoyanchev is a longtime contributor on the Spring Framework team. If you've built any web applications using Spring, then you've certainly used Rosin's code. He's also a key contributor to all things web and reactive, including Spring, web, Spring MVC, Spring Webflux, Spring Messaging, RSocket, and now also Spring GraphQL. GraphQL is a hot topic this year, so make sure you catch some of the spring GraphQL breakouts. Rossin and I actually used to work for Pivotal in the same office in New York City, so I can tell you he's one of the nicest people in the world. Rossin and Ole are going to introduce RSocket, which is a protocol created by Netflix and Facebook that brings the ideas of the reactive stream specification to the network. Take a listen. Hey, Ole. Hey, Rawson. You know, I've been working from home for as long as I can remember now, but I never imagined everyone doing the same. You know, me neither. I used to travel a lot before the pandemic, but now it's all online. Yeah, like this conference. I'm bummed, though, that we can't meet in person. Me too, me too. But when we are online, we can have so many folks all over the world joining us. So true, and it's awesome. And one positive benefit is that online learning and collaboration applications have had to evolve so fast to meet these needs. 
The problem is that it's hard to build such applications with the protocols commonly used for web applications because for a collaboration app you need to stream updates in both directions in near real time. I see. Could we use long polling to solve that? Yeah, long polling. One of the earliest, almost classic techniques. The client sends a request and the server holds the response for a little bit or longer until it has something to send back. Immediately after that, the client sends another request and the server holds the response again until it has more events and so on and so on. You know, well, you can do this, but it's very inefficient, it's challenging to work with, and it's exposed to latency issues. Hmm, how about server-side events with HTTP2 then? This is better. Server-side events, after all, is designed for streaming. But it is one-way streaming only. It is not supported on all cloud infrastructure, and it's about as basic as streaming gets. I mean, there are no heartbeats, no fragmentation, no binary data, and so on. Actually, Rosen, what about WebSocket? Ah, WebSocket is much better. It supports bidirectional streaming, fragmentation, binary data. But you know, Ole, WebSocket is just a low-level transport protocol. It doesn't care or help in any way to work with those messages. It only gets them across. What we really need is an application protocol that helps applications to work with messages, enables multiple interaction patterns, and other features specific to streaming applications. You know, Rosin, there is such a protocol, and it's called RSocket. Take a look here. I have a real-world application called Canva built on RSocket and we can use it to collaborate on presentation or Instagram post. Do you want to give it a try? Absolutely, let's do that. Cool, let's use Canva to create a presentation about RSocket. RSocket is an application protocol for remote communication. It runs on top of WebSocket, but it can also run over TCP, UDP, or other connection-oriented protocols, including plans to run it over Quick and HTTP3. RSocket enables multiple request interaction patterns, such as request response or request stream, and others. What's even more, both client and server can initiate those requests. This is a key difference from the HTTP where only a client can make a request. Our socket enables multiplexing so multiple services can share the same connection. Our socket supports reactive streams back pressure so that the producing side of a stream doesn't ever overwhelm the consuming side. And my dear friend, there is much more to that. Okay, so Canva here is using our socket. Can we take a peek under the hood and see? Sure, sure. Let's have a look at the network tab. Here, you can see we have established a WebSocket connection. And there are some binary messages coming back and forth. However, the problem here is that it's too low level and it doesn't say anything about the R socket protocol. Fortunately, there is a debugging tool for R socket frames. Let's use it to see the R socket frames in action. Here we go. We can now see that these WebSocket messages are in fact R socket frames. You can see that our socket is an application protocol and it starts with a set of frames that helps client and server to negotiate a few details. You can see independent requests on a single connection and this is multiplexing in action. Here is request response interaction and there is request stream, fire and forget and here we see request channel. Notice that this request response is actually from the server side, while the request channel is from the client side. 
that shows that each site can initiate requests independently. Here is the payload frame, which is in fact the response to that request response to the server. One more thing, here we can observe back pressure in action. Here is a request and frame that is used by one side to indicate how many more messages it can accept at this moment. Wow, this is so exciting. It's great to see RSocket in action in a real-world application for collaboration. Online collaboration is not the only problem RSocket can solve. RSocket can also help to improve resilience and performance for microservices in the backend. One exciting aspect there is, is that Reactive Stream's back pressure propagates not only across components within the JVM, but also across the network to remote peers, potentially all the way to external clients. Correct! That means that network buffers don't have to fill up as producers slow down or stop producing altogether until consumers are ready for more messages. We covered the RSocket protocol, but what about support for Spring applications? Right, so the great news, Ole, is that Spring has extensive support for RSocket applications. You can create annotated message mapping methods to handle requests with the same reactive programming model as in Webflux. And you can further compose and connect to, the, to various backends, such as SQL data stores through R2DBC, RabbitMQ, Kafka, and others. And the back pressure from all those reactive streams, components, and sources will flow through the application pipeline and over the network to remote peers, thanks to the RSocket protocol. What is also important is that RSocket is a growing ecosystem. Over the past year, in RSocket Java, there have been major updates to the leasing API. This is the mechanism to control the number of requests on a connection. There have been similar improvements to resumability, and this is the feature that allows a briefly disconnected stream to resume transparently from where it left off. There is a much improved load balancing API and so much more. And you might be wondering at this point if other languages are supported too. The answer is yes. Our socket JavaScript, that's what we saw from a browser with the Canva demo. RSocket Swift is the latest addition to RSocket and it's one that we're really excited about. It is in very active development and what's really nice is that it enables support for iOS devices. RSocket Kotlin has been written in the Kotlin language, taking advantage of the Kotlin SDK, Ktor, Flow, Coroutines and others. It's also written for Kotlin native and multi-platform, which means that it can be used for clients in a browser or an Android or iOS devices. There is a fantastic command line tool called RSocket Shell Client. The RSocket protocol and the RSocket IO website are also evolving, getting major updates, documentation guides, refining the resumability feature to prepare for quick and HTTP3 for our socket to run on, and more. Rosen, I'm so excited about it. There is a lot of going on there. I really believe in our socket. And as we've seen, our socket allows built not only collaboration apps, but also cloud native applications and microservices. If you share the same excitement as we do, we have a several sessions at Sprint One that we think you should check out. Sergey Tselovalnikov from Canva shows you how they build scalable apps with RSocket. Toshiaki Maki, the author of RSocket Shell Client, will introduce RSocket with some more technical details. Anton Arhipa from JetBrains and I have a talk focusing on using Kotlin, Spring, and RSocket. There are a number of other sessions too, so don't hesitate to look at them. With that, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, I've got an idea. 
How about this one? <laughs> oh yeah, this is a good one. Classic. Right? I don't often stream, but when I do... I use our socket. <laughs> That is some exciting technology. And it's so true that collaborative, interactive, real-time applications are more necessary today than ever before. It's great to know about new ways we can manage network flow and still keep true to the spirit of Spring to make things easy for developers. Thank you, Rawson and Ole, for explaining what's different about RSocket and how we can use it. I particularly appreciated seeing the debugging view of the RSocket frames. Very cool. Let's turn our attention from network flow control with RSocket to, develop, to developer flow at Gap Inc. Here's an example of what can be accomplished when developers have the tools they need to be in a state of flow. Heather Mickman, interim CIO, is here to share some of the bigger and more critical challenges they've, they've tackled the past year and a half. everyone, I'm so excited to be here virtually with you all today at Spring One. My name is Heather Mickman and I'm the Interim CIO at Gap Inc., which includes our portfolio of brands, Old Navy, Gap, Banana Republic, and Athleta. I've been with Gap Inc. since the beginning of the year and I'm incredibly energized by all the amazing work the company and our technology teams are doing. For example, you might not realize that Gap Inc. has thousands of microservices running in production today. I'll come back to our tech stack in a minute, but first I want to tell you a little bit about some of the bold transformations we've taken on in the last year and a half. As a retailer, our ability to scale our systems and operations is a necessity. Running most of our customer-facing digital properties in the cloud allows us to better scale quickly. Scaling our data centers without being in the cloud would be incredibly challenging. At Gap Inc., we are built to win in a changing marketplace with a digital-first mindset. Our four brands are hosted on one site, one app, and we're ranked number two in U.S. apparel e-commerce sales. In retail, peak is defined as the holiday shopping season, typically beginning in November until right before Christmas. Our highest traffic days are usually the Black Friday to Cyber Monday weekend. However, in 2020, our seasonality looked a little bit different as we sought to understand changing customer behaviors during the pandemic. We saw peak levels of shopping begin earlier than ever. In 2020, we ran peak in the cloud for the first time. Not only was this the first time running peak in the cloud, but the continued effects of the pandemic on store closures and customers' apprehension to shop in stores made it even more critical for our systems to be able to run at scale during those days. For context, our busiest hour for our e-commerce site visits was 9 p.m. and the busiest hour for purchases was 10 p.m. We saw more than 1,100 orders per minute and more than 10,000 visits per minute, almost a 20% increase from our busiest hour in 2019. If our sites or apps had failed, even briefly, we could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of shopping and disappoint our customers. So our prep to ensure that we can make peak happen is super important. Our preparation efforts last the entire year. Our forecasted volumes are defined early, and we perform many, many, many load tests to understand where we have bottlenecks in our ecosystem and adjust accordingly. As you can imagine, there is a lot of automation that goes into our testing and how we scale up so that we can easily run these tests over the course of the year as we understand more about customer preferences, trends, and traffic patterns. Our technology transformation and modernization of apps into the cloud will enable us to continue scaling our systems as we continue to see traffic and orders continue to grow year over year. It will also enable us to be prepared for unexpected traffic spikes. As an example, in the first quarter of 2021, we saw higher net sales than anticipated, close to peak volumes, and our system scaled seamlessly to enable us to meet the higher demand without issue. When we look at VMware, our entire e-commerce stack is on Spring, and we accelerated our app modernization and migration to Azure with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is now called Tanzu Application Service since VMware acquired Pivotal. 
We also utilize a microservices architecture to deliver the flexibility, speed, and reusability required to power our four brands. Beyond Peak, our technology teams had a number of big wins earlier this summer. First, when we launched the first Yeezy Gap product, we had high levels of confidence going into the launch and had scaled the entry point to the experience to 30,000 TPS. With a lot of eyes on a critical and in-demand product drop, this was a really impressive milestone. It was also my first new product launch with the team, and I'm super excited for more. We also saw a successful launch of our new integrated rewards program across the US and Puerto Rico in July. This combined the previous credit card and loyalty programs under one membership, four brands. This was a tricky technical challenge for our teams and we delivered, so a huge win. Another example of how we were able to scale super quickly was when we stood up buy online pickup curbside in just a matter of weeks back in April 2020. And we also implemented convenience hubs in our Athleta and Old Navy stores late last year. Customers have begun to expect this type of seamless experience from us, and one of our top priorities is to ensure they experience this across the entire shopping journey, whether that means shopping online, on our app, or in a store. We know that we're hitting the mark with our customers as we saw a 14% increase in our retail NPS scores in 2020, with an average score of 70 against an industry standard of 62. We set bold growth goals last October in our power plan 2023. Our ability to quickly shift as well as our agility and scale has created a strong growth trajectory that will help us reach those goals. We are able to pivot and innovate to respond to customer needs during the pandemic and are continuing to thrive. So keep an eye out for more exciting things from Gap Inc. That was awesome. Congratulations to Gap Inc. for so many big wins, especially in changing and challenging times. We're glad you can see your hard work reflected in an impressive net promoter score. You've certainly earned it. If you want to get the deep dive into how Gap Inc. approaches capacity engineering and scaling, or how they use Spring, Tanzu Application Service, and Azure Cloud to prepare for peak season, I recommend watching their deep dive session, Preparing the Gap Inc. e commerce platform for traffic surge during the holiday season. The talk was actually delivered live earlier today, but please make sure to watch the recording. All recordings will be available on September 7th on springone.io. Spring Cloud Gateway has been a hot topic on the Spring One main stage for a couple of years now. And each year we learn about new and exciting product developments. This year is no different. We're gonna hear Bella Bai and Chris Sterling, both from the Spring team, share the latest and greatest updates on API Portal and Spring Cloud Gateway. But first, we have the pleasure of hearing Alex Cook, a software engineer at CVS Health, explain why and how they used Spring Cloud Gateway for Tanzu application service in a major modernization effort. Does everyone remember what a CD-ROM is? What if I told you that it was possible to digitize that well-established 90s tech in the span of seven weeks in a company the size and age of CVS? That is exactly what we did. And to keep that experience as frictionless as possible for our developers, we used the modern building block of APIs. Our application's API had a crucial role to play in the whole process, and I'm proud to share some behind-the-scenes details of this remarkable transformation. I'm sure that many of you know CVS Health as a diversified health services company, united around a common purpose of helping people on their path to better health. The first store was created in 1963, and currently we are a Fortune 4 company with over 300,000 employees. You can imagine, with a company our size and age, there are some existing processes that need to be modernized, one of which was mailing CD-ROMs loaded with massive files to clients. Our end goal was to turn that process into a file sharing product where external and internal users can upload and download files, as well as view real-time data visualizations without ever having to worry about the overhead of sending files through the mail. With our new application, those files are available in seconds. 
Not only did this save time, but it saved money as well. Our internal users can now get files, such as invoices, out much faster and more efficiently to our clients. Let me take you through how we were able to develop, secure, and publicly expose this professional web application so quickly. It all starts with a great tech stack, including Java with Spring Boot, combined with an Angular front-end and Oracle database. The Java backend uses RESTful API calls to the microservices that handle certain tasks. We eventually landed on Spring Cloud Gateway as the means to securely route to our API, and Tanzu Application Service for hosting our application. Before using the Spring Cloud Gateway, our API was potentially exposed to the internet with no real layer of defense. This means a malicious user could, for example, come in, flood our API with requests, and take us offline. Our endpoints were originally protected by a cores configuration within our own API, but that couldn't give us the level of protection this application needed. We knew we needed a layer of protection between outside requests and ourselves that could monitor and rate limit users, and Spring Cloud Gateway immediately filled that role. We initially planned to use a standalone Spring Cloud Gateway application. However, after weighing the pros and cons of the standalone implementation, we decided to use the more robust VMware-supported Spring Cloud Gateway tile available through the Tanzu application service. We worked hand-in-hand -hand with the VMware team to integrate and improve the Spring Cloud Gateway service, making important updates to the quality of life configuration settings and fixing potential issues such as gateway memory leaks. With our new strong and stable rate-limiting defense in place, we began to tackle our next goal of moving the core's configuration logic from our API to the Spring Cloud Gateway itself. Spring Cloud Gateway is now controlling what HTTP method requests we allow, what headers can be sent on requests, and what domains are allowed to call our API through the Spring Cloud Gateway. One of the major benefits from using the service instance in Tanzu Application Service is that all these items are extremely easy to configure via the CF command used to create the gateway. A fully implemented Spring Cloud Gateway was able to give us peace of mind and removed potentially malicious access to our API, providing that extra layer of security essential to our application. To achieve other modernizations alongside the Spring Cloud Gateway, our extreme programming team had to work the business in the room with a multitude of teams outside our XP labs. Along with an ECS drive for file uploads and downloads, the data visualizations were handled by another CPS team, which, cr which created a MicroStrategy instance and the necessary database tables to display the data. We also integrated an Azure Business to Consumer User Login Flow that was managed outside our XP lab. In addition, we used Pivotal Tracker to keep track of our work and backlog, as well as to communicate effectively across teams. Throughout this whole process, we learned that Spring Cloud Gateway can be an extremely valuable security layer in front of our API. With the gateway now handling most of the request validation, such as headers, domains, and so on, the API and our developers can focus on doing the business logic they were always intended to. We also learned that we barely scratched the surface of what Spring Cloud Gateway can do. Besides the items we configured, the gateway supports much more. For example, you can configure it to use SSL slash TLS, setting certain certificates that can be trusted. I'm excited to learn more about what's coming up for Spring Cloud Gateway at the conference today. Thank you for your time. Hey Bella, and to all of you listening, I can't believe that it's been nearly a year since our last keynote on Spring Cloud Gateway for VMware Tanzu. Hey Chris, 
Yeah, it was fun to show off those pet photos from our animal rescue sample application. They were so cute! Not sure if it's related, and it might surprise you to know, the animal adoption rate has gone up a lot since our last talk. Wow, that's great to hear! Similar to the animal adoption rate, you can see that the API adoption rate has gone up as well. We are hearing loud and clear that all of you are creating internally and externally facing APIs. APIs are the backbone of integration across teams, lines of business, and organizations. And we've also seen that Kubernetes adoption is growing in our application developer community. Based on this increase in API adoption, we're excited to make a couple of announcements of how we are helping you build and deploy APIs in a consistent and effective way on Kubernetes. First, we'll show you Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes, a distributed API gateway to route, secure, and monitor API requests to services with a Kubernetes native operational experience. And we'll follow this up with API Portal for VMware Tanzu to help API consumers discover and try out APIs. Let's start with Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes and the GitOps for APIs approach that you can leverage for accelerating API development and delivery. Getting APIs to production involves both operations and application development. Therefore, we have separated operational and app dev concerns through custom resources and our Spring Cloud Gateway operator that provides a Kubernetes native interface for managing your API deployments. The first custom resource I'll show you is a Spring Cloud Gateway instance configuration. You can define the operational characteristics and metadata for the API gateway itself and use kubectl to apply this resource to your cluster of choice. Separately from the operational characteristics of the API gateway, you can define APIs for your application services. You define these in an API route configuration file that lives with your source code. It describes a service name to route traffic to, along with detailed information about the API routes themselves and how they should be handled. And since the Spring Cloud Gateway custom resource only describes the characteristics of the API gateway and the route configuration only defines the APIs for an application service, we need a way to map the API routes onto an API gateway. This is what the mapping custom resource does. By applying a mapping to your cluster namespace, you are telling Spring Cloud Gateway operator to map these API routes onto a specific API gateway instance. Bella will now show our new sample app, Acme Fitness, an online retail application for you to find, review, and purchase fitness equipment. Thanks, Chris. What you see here is an architecture diagram for the Acme Fitness app, displaying an interconnected and complicated system. The front-end app needs to talk to multiple APIs to fulfill various user operations that can trigger calls to additional downstream microservices. With a gateway standing in between, we get to avoid a lot of the common hassle like cores, global authentication, and APIs changing locations. Without further ado, let me show you how to get this app up and running with our Spring Cloud Gateway product. As you can see, this cluster has Spring Cloud Gateway already installed. So like Chris mentioned before, some YAML definition is all you need to get a Spring Cloud Gateway instance running. Then you can use Customize to deploy all the databases, applications, and Spring Cloud Gateway resources onto a Kubernetes cluster. An ingress is created to expose the gateway. With a DNS record set for this ingress, we can now visit the website. Look at these beautiful items. While well, I'm logging in here as our sample user. Chris, would you like to get a new basketball? Yes, please. And I also need a bike to get to the basketball court. Sounds like an active weekend plan. Let's add them to the cart and check out. Let me put in some fake credit card info here. And the final confirmation. Great, the order is successfully placed. Awesome. Now that we've shown how you can publish APIs, imagine your team needs to monitor the health and usage of your production APIs. You can view metrics and tracing data in Tanzu Observability or Prometheus and Grafana. It's your choice. Bella, can you walk us through the Acme Fitness Tanzu Observability dashboard? Happy to. The minimum information we need is a Kate secret that contains your Wavefront URL and API token. Optionally, you can also customize things like Wavefront application name or service name. After applying the changes, you can see the metrics dashboard. It shows you the number of routes available on the gateway, success rates, 
average response time, and more. You can add your own queries or tweak it however you want. I have a traffic generator running to simulate some users. So what you're seeing here is a traffic map generated from the live tracing data. This map is very similar to the architecture diagram you saw earlier. The biggest difference is that it never gets out of date. If we dive into one of these links, we can see the exact request chain, the timing of each span, and the request details all in one place. Yeah, with these metrics and tracing dashboards, you can use the data to troubleshoot and optimize your APIs. Now that you publish your APIs and are able to monitor them, how can you discover the potentially hundreds and thousands of APIs available in your organization? We've got a solution for that as well. Bella, please show us how Spring Cloud Gateway's auto-generated open API documentation and how you can discover and try out APIs using API portal for VMware Tanzu. Absolutely. Here, we've defined API metadata in our Spring Cloud Gateway custom resource, including title and description. As we launch the API portal, we see all API groups listed in one place. Let's drill into the Acme Fitness API group we've been looking at today. All the information on this page, the title, the description, the endpoints, are all defined and generated from the custom resources. Let's take our user login endpoint as example. You can see the path, the method, and the schema of the request body, all coming from the YAML definition on the right. This is another endpoint to showcase the path parameters. Here is the fun part. You can try the endpoint on API portal directly. Let's check the product details based on the ID. Here we go. You now know everything about this magical yoga mat. Great. API Perl doesn't only work with Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes auto-generated open API documentation. You could add any number of open API source URLs to be displayed, found, and tried out by potential API consumers. So if you have existing open API documentation in your organization, you can use API Portal to provide a one-stop shop for finding APIs. In the demo, Bella, I noticed that we're managing our own username and password credentials on the site. Imagine you want to modernize this retail site's authentication to use OpenID Connect for single sign-on. For example, with Google Authentication. Can you show us a way to carry this out and do the transition smoothly? Yes. Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes comes with SSO integration, which supports most of the functionality we need from the user service. But the interfaces are not quite the same. This is a common issue in a lot of the app modernization efforts. Our new custom extension support can help you bridge that gap. As you can see here, the gateway resource is configured with a Kate secret for setting up SSO integration. It also takes a list of jars in the form of config maps. Inside the jars, you can package your custom filters, predicates, or any spring beans to extend your gateway however you want. This is the only YAML needed to replace the old user service. Instead of sending username and password for login requests, you just need to set SSO enable to true to enforce login. Instead of retrieving user information from another service, we're using our custom filter here to return what Gateway has in the security context. After applying the YAML files, we can come back to the app and log in with Google Authentication. Now we're logged in. Nice work, Bella. This is only one example of how you can leverage custom extensions to modernize in a safe and efficient way towards a more modern approach. We're excited to see where all of you take this powerful capability in the future. We've shown you today how Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes and API Portal for VMware Tanzu can be used to develop, deploy, and expose your APIs. The increased amount of APIs being deployed is forcing organizations to quickly compile their overall API strategy. An API strategy must address many concerns, such as team and organizational agility, dynamic environment updates, day two operational concerns, runtime observability, application service sprawl, API discovery, versioning, backward compatibility, and the list could go on and on. Our focus has been to reduce the amount of the concerns that an organization must deal with themselves and instead rely on our API enablement products to take care of the rest. Centralized API management approaches can impede delivery of API changes. Our surveys have shown that most API releases are impacted by days and weeks of delay. 
the importance of an evolutionary API economy in organizations to create value means we need an approach that enables application developers to make changes quickly while adhering to compliance and governance requirements without significant delays or wait states. You've seen today how Spring Cloud Gateway and API Portal provides a developer-friendly approach to grow your organization's API economy. Thank you for spending this time with us. Please check out these other talks and workshops to learn more about how VMware Tanzu is helping you deliver on your API strategy. Thank you, and check out our sample app as well. Spring Cloud Gateway never disappoints. It's exciting to see how it improves every year. The Kubernetes and API portal support are major leaps forward. And if Chris and Bella catalyzed an increase in pet adoptions with their demo last year, I guess we'll find out next year if they were able to impact basketball and bicycle sales. And it's fascinating to hear from Alex on the details of how CVS accomplished a major modernization with Spring Cloud Gateway playing a key role and how they collaborated closely with the product team at VMware. Many thanks to CVS for sharing their story. Back in April, VMware announced a partnership with the U.S. Army Futures Command to establish an Army unit in Austin, Texas that focuses on software development. VMware Tanzu Labs paired with soldier engineers to help set the foundation for a U.S. Army software factory. Today, we get to hear how that partnership went from U.S. Army Software Factory Director, Major Vito Errico, and Chief Product and Innovation Officer, Hannah Hunt. <music> The objective of the Army Software Factory is to enable and empower soldiers to solve problems through software engineering at the edges of the battlefield. Um, if you think about how the Army has traditionally operated, we've always sort of relied on having contractors or outsourcing uh, software engineering to third parties. Uh, we think that the future operating environments as um, technology becomes more and more increasingly software-centric, um, it's really important to build that capacity and that competency within our everyday soldiers. And there's no shortage of talent within the Army. You know, we've done thousands of soldier interviews and realized that there are folks across the Army that have learned how to uh, code in their spare time. And so we're really taking that hidden talent within the Army and operating ourselves, the Army Software Factory, like a Silicon Valley startup. I think, you know, it's fair to say that the Software Factory is a great initiative that's demonstrating that the Army is going to better leverage its existing tech talent to prepare to operate on those increasingly technical battlefields. And we really care about what the users want, not just per building something to some prescribed requirement, but rather building applications that go into a production environment and actually provide value to users. And we do that through utilizing you know, future-proof infrastructure and platform choices that en enable that developer experience to be as easy as possible so that we can constantly iterate and constantly put applications into production. For as much as we talk about building software at the software factory, it's very much about building autonomous product teams of people that can operate by themselves at some point in the future. And that's, that gets us back to the idea of abstracting away as much as we possibly can so that the developers can focus on problem scoping, problem decomposition, and actual software engineering. Um, that's why we think focusing on critical thinking, focusing on, on talent, tech talent management, and then focusing on operating like a modern Silicon Valley uh, startup um, is, is how we can help usher in new change for the Army. One of the things that we're trying to do at the Army Software Factory is to, is to pilot, just like testing software, is to pilot ideas and, th and then scale them out once they're proven to be true. Uh, a great example of that is our, is our pilot project, our, our CASEL uh, application sorter, um, that we prototyped with everyday soldiers. I think what's key to take away here is that we didn't build anything in a vacuum. We decided to pilot it as we developed the software factory concept. Um, so we just took everyday soldiers and we asked them to observe some user behavior at some of the lower level uh, tactical warehouses that exist in the army. And uh, sure enough, just by observing user behavior, we were able to, to build a, a software uh, solution in 99 days, uh, dev uh, test staging and production in, in a cloud environment, which is pretty unique um, for, for the mainstream army. And it's pretty impressive how we've been able to use Spring and uh, 
the uh, Tanzu application service as well as hosting this on multi-cloud, not just in Azure, but also in AWS. There's not many organizations that have a multi-cloud application in production, and that's something that we're really proud of. One of the key takeaways for us is the fact that um, you know, we're, we're piloting small and preparing to scale large. And that's why the focus on Kubernetes, that's why the focus on Spring. And what's really unique about this is that we've been piloting this notion of a continuous authority to operate. So within the federal government, in order for an application to be uh, in production, it needs what's called an authority to operate. Basically, you're allowing it to be accessed by users. Uh, this typically takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months to get approval. And as Vito mentioned, we did it in 99 days. And we did this through this model of using continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines and using uh, the VMware Tanzu stack to be able to build and define some pre predefined security guardrails. So if an application passed this uh, continuously, they could go into production without some manual intervention or some manual checklist. So we're automating a lot of those compliance activities so that we can constantly deliver value to soldiers. Yeah, by automating everything that could be automatable, um, we were able to really focus on our, our soldiers, which is obviously the lifeblood of everything that we're doing at the software factory. What we really care about is that we are enabling soldiers so that they can build and deliver software capabilities for other soldiers, that by soldiers for soldiers moniker. And that's really enabled by us working with the VMware Tanzu Labs folks so that they can pair and learn that expertise themselves so that they can eventually train other soldiers in how to build software. So we hope we've demonstrated uh, that we're taking an extremely thoughtful approach as we build out and conceptualize everything that the Army Software Factory is about, leveraging the existing tech talent that's inside the Army. Uh, focusing on a solution that will scale, uh, not just something that we can do just one time. And then, of course, um, operating like a, like a modern Silicon Valley company. In closing, I think there's just a tremendous amount of tech talent inside the Army, and this is a great way to both leverage it and empower it to operate as a more technically proficient Army in the future. I love the laser focus on empowering people in a scalable way. That's where Tanzu Labs excels in helping customers. It's impressive to hear what the U.S. Army Software Factory has accomplished in such a short time. They'll continue to have access to Tanzu products and services as they enable more soldier and civilian engineers over the next five years. Now, you might have noticed that the theme of this year's Spring One is flow, less friction, more productivity, more flow. Our next and last speaker for the day wrote a whole book on flow for optimizing software productivity. I can't think of anyone better to wrap up day one. Please welcome Artie Starr. Hi everyone, I am Artie Starr. If you made a Venn diagram of me, I am a software engineer, artist, animator, writer, speaker, entrepreneur. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned about flow. We talk about this concept in the software world of this flow state where we're so fully focused and in the zone, so completely absorbed in our craft that time seems to zoom by. Have you ever been like, whoa, it's 6 p.m. How did that happen? This is what it feels like. Since software development requires this sustained focus and thinking to solve these abstract puzzles in our head, our ability to get into flow state is a huge boon to our productivity. Mihai Cheek sent Mihai researched this topic extensively in his book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. This book was written in 1990, but I would argue is one of the most important books to read in 2021. So one important thing I hope you take away from this talk is that you should add this book to your reading list. This is a seed of wisdom. One of the things you learn in the book is not only is this flow experience our most productive and our most creative time, it also corresponds to the times we experience our greatest joy. As opposed to joy being something that happens when we're in a passive restful state, it's actually the opposite. Our peak experiences actually come, as Cheek sent me, I would say, when our body or mind is stretched to its limits as we voluntarily try to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So when have you experienced joy in software development? Like real authentic soul felt joy. The experience that comes to mind for me is my first experience with programming. So when I first went to college, I wanted to be a singer-songwriter and major in music. Music was my entire life. 
But then when I got in school and started to realize what a career in music would actually be like, I realized I don't think I really want to do this. And I was all distraught. So my boyfriend at the time, trying to cheer me up, thought, hey, let's take a class together. That'll be fun. And he's flipping through the class catalog. Then he finds, ooh, x86 assembly. That sounds fun. And you got to realize my only experience with computers at this point is playing King's Quest with my family. And here I am about to learn how to write code, basically starting with zeros and ones. But once I got in class, it kind of reminded me of programming my TI-85 calculator in math class. You know, I've got some basic instructions. I could do this. And so I started reading through the textbook that night. And then I found interrupts. And I realized I can switch to graphics mode. I can make the PC speaker beep. And I started writing the game Breakout, completely in assembly, not knowing any other programming languages even existed. I had a little paddle that moved around with a mouse and little rainbow colored blocks and a little ball that bounced around the screen and beeped at different frequencies as it hit the walls. It was awesome. And then I showed my teacher what I was working on. He's like, um, why don't you just keep going with that? Show me what you're working on, take the final, and you get an A. I'm thinking, all right, I like this class. But that's when it hit me. I can create anything. I can dream. If we can dream it up, if we can figure out a way to build it with software, and like we've got all the coolest toys in the world right now, truly. We have the power to bring our dreams to life. How amazing is software really? Like, let that sink in. We are like the magicians of this world. As a fellow software engineer, I hope you build software first and foremost because you love it, because it's fun, and it's awesome that we actually get paid to do something we love. I don't think jobs really get much better than that. I bring up this joy thing because, as Csikszentmihalyi said, symbols can be deceptive. They have a tendency to distract us from the reality they're supposed to represent. What are we optimizing for? What's our North Star? Our society codes us to desire certain sorts of things, more money, a better job, a bigger house. These sorts of things become a definition of life success. These symbols are things that are supposed to make us happy. But if we take a step back from it all, what matters? What really matters? Joy matters. That was the conclusion I eventually came to. Our own joy matters. The joy of our teammates matter. The joy of our families, our kids, our friends, our community matters. Joy is generative, contagious, and healing when it's real. And you can't really fake it either. Fake happiness isn't the same thing as genuine heartfelt joy. Optimize for joy is a compass, a North Star we can strive for. So if we put our engineering caps on, figure out how to engineer these flow experiences and design them into the system, maybe we can engineer a fountain spring of joy. So how do we do it? How do we engineer flow experiences? How do we engineer a joyful developer experience? It's a good North Star question. One of the keys to this puzzle is that joy only happens in the case of intrinsic motivation, when our heart is genuinely in alignment with what we're doing. It's not something that can be forced from the outside. It doesn't work. But when we accomplish something difficult and worthwhile because we care about what we're doing and work really hard with a cool group of people to make it happen, like it feels really good. The greatest experiences of my life were building something really cool with an amazing team. Being difficult, being worthwhile, these are the things that make the journey more fun. This journey we go on together, of climbing a mountain together, it becomes our story. In the moment when we're there on that climb, all of our energy is being focused and pulled to the challenge of the mountain. This is where this flow state energy comes from. It's this kind of hyper-powered focusing energy that we use to get stuff done. The challenge level is also really important. If the challenge is too easy for our skill level, we get bored. If the challenge is too hard, we get anxious and feel overwhelmed and shut down. So the key is to be right in this Goldilocks zone where the challenge is just right for our skill level. Though not everyone is at the same skill level. Over the last decade, there's been a ridiculous amount of complexity that we've added to our software infrastructure. As a baseline of things you gotta know to be even basically proficient, we've made things insanely hard for newcomers. All this complexity we take on, it certainly keeps things from being boring. But at what point are we creating challenge for the sake of challenge? Are the problems we're solving really the right problems? If we take a step back and look at the big picture, the really big challenges we face as a world right now, 
Are we really focused on the most important worthwhile things? As engineers, we have the capability to build many things. If we can dream it up, if we can translate it to code, we can build anything we can dream. And joy matters. As a first principle, let's remember that. Okay, I've got a challenge for you. I want you to imagine yourself standing in front of a whiteboard, big picture. We've got the education system, the industry system, and the hiring and recruiting system as some big boxes. Then put this aside and think about this difficulty curve from beginner all the way up to top contributor and imagine all these experiences along the way as we grow up, our first 20 years experience. Then ask yourself, how could we design the system to optimize for joy? Let yourself dream. If we can see these human systems challenges as engineering design challenges, then we've got a whole toolbox full of existing skills we can use to help us think about ways to make things better. So in closing, I wanted to say, I realize that Optimize for Joy runs a bit counter to our age old system of Optimize for Money. But since its flow experience also corresponds to our most productive and creative time, there's no fundamental reason why these two things can't be in alignment with one another so we arrive at a win-win even if it means we have to do some rethinking about how things might work. In this changing world, in the wake of all this disruption, innovation is key. And maybe this gives us a starting place for thinking about what those innovations might be. So read the book, put your engineering cap on, and really think about how we can engineer for joy. Thank you. Amazing, so inspiring, flow leads to joy. Did you all here already ask if we can engineer a fountain spring of joy? Do you think maybe she meant a spring fountain of joy? Because I think that's what this conference is. Make sure you also add Artie's book, Idea Flow, to your reading list, and you can learn more about how she's helping engineering teams at openmastery.com. It's good to know we can get more flow and more joy consciously and methodically, but it's also good to remember to take breaks, relax, socialize, and laugh, which brings me to tomorrow. First thing on the Spring One schedule for tomorrow is a Zumba class to make sure we all get started on the right foot with plenty of joy. I know I'll be doing it. After that, we've got another packed day of great talks. That's all for today. Remember, recordings will be available on September 7th. See you back here tomorrow for more Spring One Joy flow. Same thing.